in Louisville, Kentucky, Breonna Taylor was killed in her sleep by police who were executing a drug arrest with a no-knock warrant in the middle of the night. Her boyfriend, a licensed gun owner, fired at the police as he, legitimately so, believed he was being robbed. The police fired 20 rounds into her apartment, penetrating her with eight bullets. Breonna Taylor was an EMT, and she was murdered while she was asleep in her bed. The police found nothing of substance in their home, yet her boyfriend was arrested and charged with murder. Breonna Taylor was murdered as a result of a drug warrant for a crime that has no victim. This is just one of many senseless deaths that have resulted from the United States war on drugs, which has become a global war on drugs. It is a war against people. It is a war on victimless crimes. All crimes that result from drug policy are the result of the black market itself. Without the outlaw of the drugs, there would not be any crimes to commit that would result in the murder of people. A crime is when you murder someone. A crime is when you rob someone. A crime is when you rape someone. A crime is where you loot the treasury for trillions of dollars while the American people are starving. Those are crimes. Choosing to smoke cannabis is not a crime. Choosing to experiment with psychedelics is not a crime. Choosing to alter your consciousness how you see fit is not a crime. It was made into a crime for political purposes by racist, authoritarian, anti-democratic forces and this sad legacy has endured for far too long and it must come to an end. The war on drugs officially began in the 1970s under the Nixon administration, one of the most corrupt administrations in the history of our country that would have ended in impeachment had he not resigned beforehand. It was an outright attack against his political enemies and Nixon administration officials are on record saying as such. They criminalized drugs so they could justify arresting protesters, anti-war activists, everyone that they disagreed with, and of course, minorities. This is not a war on drugs at the heart of the matter. This is a war on consciousness. They want to be able to control the psyche of the people that serve them. It is not unbelievable to think this, just look at the types of drugs that are legal. Alcohol, cigarettes, pharmaceutical medications, things that completely take you out of your consciousness. No, what they really want to be able to do is to control you. You are only allowed to alter your consciousness in state-approved ways, with state-approved substances. Any substance that promotes thinking about things from an alternative point of view like cannabis, are the ones that are the most illicit. The government, the ruling class, they don't want people to be autonomous in their thinking. They only condone the use of drugs that promote escaping your problems rather than confronting them. Any substance that promotes empathy, compassion, or humility is forbidden. Any other substance that promotes egotism aggression, or belligerence, or an escape from reality that is not conscious is legal, because that is precisely where they want you. But obviously this is not just about controlling consciousness, this is about profit, because we live under a capitalist system. This is also about institutionalized systemic racism, as drug crimes consistently, disproportionately affect people of color. We don't have to remind you about the crime bill, which was in part written by Joe Biden, which helped to disproportionately lock up and target black and brown, mostly men. The prison industrial complex targets people so that they can be brought into private prisons to work slave labor 
for corporations to build the products and services that we all use for pennies on the dollar if they even get paid at all. We've talked about this on our channel. Private prisons are the new plantation. This is modern day slavery. And while this certainly does affect people of color disproportionately, and we do not want to minimize their pain in any way, it affects everybody as well. Both Tori and I, when we were 18, 19 years old, were extorted by this criminal drug system. We never hurt a soul. We never would hurt a person in our lives. We're completely pacifist, nonviolent vegans. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, we were treated as criminals and locked up because we chose to experiment with our consciousness in a way that was not approved. And we recognize our privilege in those situations. Both of us were not convicted. We were able to seal our record and move on with our lives. But this privilege is not afforded to many people who encounter these circumstances. One mistake when you're very young can likely ruin your life forever. We do believe that if you commit a crime while under the influence of any substance, that you should get in trouble for the crime that you committed. But why would you prosecute the drug and the crime rather than just the crime? It is more profitable to treat people who use drugs like criminals. Mm -hmm. But really, what they need is counseling and rehabilitation. When you put someone in a prison where it is guaranteed that they're going to be exposed to heinous trauma, which is a trigger for using drugs in the first place, that they're only going to have an even harder time escaping the pain that they were already trying to escape by using drugs in the first place. So it's this dangerous self-fulfilling prophecy by throwing a drug addict or drug user into the prison system. It's further victimizing a victim. And the scarlet letter that very often young people are given for life once they make a mistake, again, where they've never hurt a soul, can ruin the rest of their life to the point where the only jobs they can get, maybe, is working in fast food for minimum wage or some other demeaning job that gives them no meaning and makes them hate their life. Or, if they do have a level of self-respect where they will not settle for that, it forces them back into a life of crime. And you must understand, this is the intention of almost every law written under capitalism. It is to perpetuate itself, to keep profits flowing forever. It is not to protect you. It is to ensure that there is an ever-growing cycle of drug arrests and profit that result from them. And boy, are drug arrests profitable. Let's talk about asset forfeiture. Many people are not aware that police have complete control over your body and your property when you are detained by them. So this means that if they think that your car was paid for with drug money, they can take your car. <laughs> they can take your house. And a lot of people have never heard of asset forfeiture. But police take more property than all combined robberies. That is a staggering statistic. It's unbelievable. And it happens all the time. Now, if you have any amount of money on you, like say that you don't trust keeping all your money in bank accounts and you have $10,000 stashed somewhere in your house for an emergency, and a lot of people do this, a lot of people do. If they come in and arrest you for a drug crime, they can seize that $10,000, say that you made it from drug money, and it is almost impossible to get it back. They will take everything and say that you bought it with drug money. They will also take your body. Did you know that state-sanctioned legal rape by police officers is allowed in more states than it's not allowed in. 35 states out of 50 allow police officers to legally rape detainees because they can assume that they have consented to anything that happens to them while they're in custody. And the reason why that's relevant is because it happens with drug crimes all the time. 
Mm -hmm. It's used as a way to extort people. They say, if you let me have sex with you, I'll let you get off without charging you. Mm -hmm. It's a disgusting scheme. Several officers this year have gotten in trouble for this. And it's been going on for a very long time. All cops are bastards. Bastards. So make no mistake, all of these drug laws, like all laws under capitalism, are there to extort wealth, property, sexual favors. It's all about extraction, always. It's about extracting from the poor to benefit the ruling class. That is what these drug laws are. They are not for your safety. And how do we know that these laws are not about your safety? Well, illicit drug deaths usually range from 30,000 to 40,000 per year, approximately. It changes from year to year. But let's look at the deaths from alcohol. Normally, over 100,000, that's a shady one because they, that's directly implicated by like liver cirrhosis and things like that. But alcohol is involved in so many deaths. Um, and it's an attributing factor to suicides and a lot of other issues. So alcohol is responsible for killing a lot of people. But it's legal. But it's legal. It's legal. Um, tobacco. Half a million people just in the country of the United States. Uh, five million around the world approximately. Probably more at this point because of how stressed that everybody's been over the <laughs> past few years. Uh, and then pharmaceuticals. Uh, that number, again, is concealed and manipulated because of industry. The pharmaceutical companies are some of the most powerful in the world. Um, but 100,000, uh, if not much, much more. But it's legal. But it's legal because it's always about your safety. How many people has marijuana killed? Zero. All time. Zero. But it's for your safety. <laughs> We believe that humans should be free to intoxicate themselves however they wish as long as they are not hurting people while doing so. I feel like the golden rule of life should simply be do no harm. That should be the only rule that society has to live under. Graham Hancock had an excellent TED talk that was actually banned a few years ago because it talked about the positive use of certain substances. And he had a fantastic quote during that TED talk and I might be paraphrasing here, but he says something to the effect of, if we do not have sovereignty over our own consciousness, then we have absolutely no freedom to speak of. And I believe that's very profound because how can we not be free to choose one drug that is much healthier, far less harmful to our body, and has a lot of positive effects overall compared to other drugs such as cannabis, or be forced to use only drugs that are extremely hazardous to your health. Otherwise, you are not permitted to alter your consciousness at all. How is that freedom? Hi, my name is Alvin. I'm from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Do you have a moment to talk about your spiritual future? Why, yes, I am all about talking about our spiritual future. I'm Indigo. Why don't you come on in and join me for some tea? Come on in and let's have a seat on the floor. The energy is much more grounding that way. Well, geez, thank you so much for inviting me in. It is so hot out there today and I've had so many doors slammed in my face. I just want to ask you, Indigo, have you ever heard the wonderful story of Joseph Smith? Hmm. No, but I wonder, Alvin, have you ever heard the story of Mother Ayahuasca? Gee, I don't think so, Indigo. Did she know Jesus? She knows everyone, but not everyone knows her. Ah, well, she sounds swell. Joseph Smith actually found the magical seeing stones, and it allowed him to interpret the teachings of the Bible like never before. And this is why Mormons have the one true version of spirituality. Oh yes, that is interesting. In fact, I found some high energy crystals during a spiritual treat last summer in Sedona. They're charging outside right now. I might even let you hold one later. Mother Ayahuasca has a way of revealing truths about ourselves. 
and she tells me that there is something very special within you, Alvin, that is yet to be discovered. Oh boy, we all know there's no touching yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> but that is interesting. Maybe she actually speaks to you? I've been trying to hear the voice of God my entire life. Mm. I sense you have some unresolved feelings within you. Mm. She will help you get closer to your faith. Mm. Well, that sounds pretty interesting, but I don't know if it's a good idea. You see, my companion Levi that usually is with me when I knock doors, he's not with me today because he's not feeling well. And I don't think that he'd be okay with me engaging in whatever we're talking about. Anything outside the Book of Mormon would open me up to following a false idol. Oh, she's no false idol, Alvin. She is the spiritual manifestation of God's creation. Oh. If you choose to talk to her, I guarantee you will get closer to the God within you. <laughs> you know what? I think our tea is ready. Let me go get that for us. What kind of tea is this again? It's herbal tea. Go on, drink. It looks disgusting. It smells disgusting, too. It'll help cleanse you. Go, drink. Oh my god! That is the worst thing I've ever tasted! I understand, but it's part of your trial. You are drinking the essence of the earth. You have to go through the pain to get to the payoff. Okay, if you say so. All the way. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about some of these forbidden drugs and what we believe to be the real reason why they are forbidden. We could start with cannabis. And I will just add as a cliff note that cannabis, of course, can be abused and it's not always used in the healthiest way, such as when you smoke it, because it is a product of combustion and it's more inflammatory that way. So smoking cannabis is not the best way to do it, and it can be abused and used for avoidance. But it is also essential for a lot of people in understanding themselves, in getting back in touch with their physical bodies, something that we are just so disconnected from. So we think that cannabis is especially dangerous to the ruling class because it does help a lot of people understand themselves, which doesn't make a very good consumer, does it? Although smoking cannabis is not the healthiest way to consume it, and there are carcinogens in the products of combustion, the long-term effects of studying cannabis have not revealed lung cancer or any of those side effects whatsoever. The US government was desperate to prove that connection for years, so they commissioned a study that lasted for decades. And they, they followed people who smoked cannabis alone, people who did not smoke at all, and people who smoked cannabis and cigarettes. And what they found was there was no increase in lung cancer cases for just cannabis users. And there actually was a protective effect for people that smoked cannabis, but also smoked cigarettes. They got cancer at a lower rate than typical cigarette smokers. So actually, smoking the cannabis while smoking cigarettes was actually beneficial to these people's lung health. We'll link that study because it is fascinating. Fascinating. And it's a great example of the government just flushing money down the toilet for <laughs> a decades-long study and it completely backfiring because they are so desperate to prove their mumbo-jumbo about cannabis. We do enjoy cannabis and it's because we have gone long periods without using it as a sort of experiment. Every year we do Sober October where we don't use any substances for an entire month and we notice a very significant difference from when we do use it versus when we don't. You sleep better. The anti-inflammatory effects of cannabis are documented. You can read many studies about it because they contain cannabinoids, which a lot of people have not heard about, but we actually have an endocannabinoid system in our bodies. 
which is only activated by a few things, cannabis being one of them. You can get natural cannabinoids through anandamide when you exercise. Mm -hmm. The runner's high. The runner's that, high. That's anandamide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And certain spices and foods contain cannabinoids. Mm -hmm. But largely, if you don't do any of those things, you are going to be deficient in cannabinoids. So when you finally start to get them in your system, you notice a lot of different effects like being able to sleep better, being able to manage anger, being able to understand your emotions. Mm -hmm. Like, we feel that it's very key in helping us empathize. Yes. And it reminds us of our compassion. And at this point, this is all hard science. It's not conjecture from a couple of burnout hippies, okay? <laughs> Dr. Raphael Meshulam has been studying cannabis in Israel for many, many years. MAPS is a fantastic scientific organization, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. They have been carrying out studies on cannabis, MDMA, psychedelics uh, for decades now at this point and showing very positive results. So there is very hard science out there. Now, will you hear this contradicted by people who have interest in the private prison complex? Of course you will, because they have to maintain their drug laws in order to keep their private prisons filled so that corporations can extort those people for free labor. Of course you're going to hear conflicting studies, but it does not change the fact that there is very hard science behind all the health benefits of cannabis, both physically and mentally. The two main cannabinoids that you have probably heard about that come from cannabis would be THC, the substance that is psychoactive and gets you high. Tetrahydrocannabinol. Thank you. And then there is also CBD, cannabidiol which is the non-psychoactive cannabinoid that a lot of people are using for pain relief and anxiety relief. And it is sold in all 50 states, I believe. It is legal because it does not get you high. Yes, we have experience working in the cannabis industry. There are a lot of good things and a lot of bad things about the cannabis industry. However, we do feel it's very important to say that CBD supplements that you can buy in like Alabama and places like that, it's very likely that there's no actual CBD in them because they fall under supplement laws. And if you're not familiar with United States supplement laws, they are incredibly disgusting. <laughs> there's absolutely no regulation whatsoever. So you can literally like put cyanide in a capsule and sell it to somebody and say that it's CBD. And there would be very little legal liability for that company. You're basically just taking their word for what's in there. Let's talk about the introspective qualities of cannabis because we feel it's very important to talk about. This is really what distinguishes cannabis from alcohol. They are the two most popular drugs that are used in Western society, and they are very different in their effects. It's very easy to see why one is encouraged under capitalism and one is forbidden under capitalism. Because cannabis does cause you to kind of take a step inside of yourself and look at your behavior from a third party perspective. You could be having a vicious argument with somebody and then use some cannabis. And then you're like, whoa, I was being an asshole. <laughs> you're not able to see that you're being an asshole under normal circumstances, but that change in perspective really helps you calm down, really helps you see how you're being toward people, and it makes you mellow out, which we could all use a lot more of in this country. Whereas with alcohol, if you are drinking and you get into an argument with somebody, you're more likely to get into a physical altercation with them, or it would just blow out of proportion to where you can't take it all back. So alcohol-induced fights are gonna look completely different from cannabis-induced fights. There's a reason that alcohol is implicated in over half of domestic abuse situations. I believe it's like two-thirds or three-quarters, actually, and child abuse as well. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is implicated in both of those heinous situations. Uh, nobody smokes cannabis and beats the crap out of somebody. Nobody smokes cannabis and rapes someone. If people smoke cannabis, they're extra aware of their behavior. And as such, capitalists really don't want you to have that. Yes, many users report when they use cannabis, the mind-body connection, mm -hmm. which means you're more able to feel the knots in your body. When you stretch, you're more able to 
walk yourself through the emotions that you, that are coming up. You're more able to meditate because you can kind of direct your focus. You can direct where your breath goes. The mind-body connection is my favorite side effect of using cannabis. If you are ever feeling stressed out and you just need a break, cannabis and yoga go together like peas and carrots. <laughs> the release of tension that you will achieve with that combination will just make you cry tears of joy. It's really special. <laughs> <laughs> now, because it does help you kind of communicate with your inner self and feel your way through your body, shady people and control freaks don't like it. <laughs> Seriously, a lot of people have done cannabis exactly one time mm -hmm. and they'll never do it again mm -hmm. because they say things like, I just don't like being out of control mm. or it made me paranoid. Yeah. And these are kind of like our inner demons trying to come to the surface so that way you can finally address them for the first time in your life and you are choosing to say no to that. This is not to say that if you've had a bad experience on cannabis and were kind of scared away from it, that that means that you're definitely a shady person or a bad person no. or anything like that. Sometimes it will just make up your mind for you that it's time to think about it. Mm -hmm. And you can't think about anything else. And that can be very scary for some people. But normally it gives you the experience that you need to have in that moment. That's the thing about cannabis. It's a very intuitive substance. If you need to have a bad experience because you've been avoiding thinking about something, you're gonna have that experience whether you like it or not. I feel like you can apply that logic to most consciousness expanding drugs like psychedelics, which we'll get into now. There is a lot to say about psychedelics and there are a lot of different types of psychedelics. But psychedelics literally means mind manifesting. So as you said just a moment ago, it kind of forces you to think about the things that you've been suppressing. There are many varieties of psychedelics, um, starting with the natural, like psilocybin mushrooms, peyote, which is a species of cactus. DMT is derived from many natural substances, uh, from certain plants in South America to a species of toad. Uh, it is also synthetically produced. Uh, the smokable form is normally synthetically um, produced. Iboga, which is used to make ibogaine, is a plant that grows in Africa. Uh, that's more of a shamanistic tradition over there. There are many ways to use psychedelics. So why do people use psychedelics? Well, there has been evidence to show that the earliest human civilizations have used psychedelics. Actually, some anthropologists are proponents of the stoned ape theory, meaning that our primitive ancestors came along and found psychedelic mushrooms and ate them, and that actually played a part in our evolution into making our brains into what they are today. Can't really confirm or deny that, but it is an interesting theory, and it has gained some traction in recent years. Yeah, I believe that people use psychedelics because we're all looking for the same things, which is meaning and purpose in life and healing. And part of the MAPS scientific studies is derived from the idea that we all have an innate ability to heal ourselves. With the right tools, we can work through trauma. And that is something that psychedelics are excellent in helping us all with. Again, we are not condoning drug use. We are not trying to get in trouble with the law here, blah, 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 blah. You know the thing. Some of the most widely reported effects of using psychedelics is a feeling of interconnectedness. We all feel a sense of love for the universe, for ourselves, for each other, which is invaluable because we are in a very hyper-individualistic society. If we could all just experience this sort of interconnectedness even just once in our life, we may be able to recognize the humanity in each other and move past this primitive othering that has been instilled in us by capitalism for centuries now. And it does not take repeated use to achieve these effects. This is another reason why capitalists really hate these drugs, and especially the studies that are going on now proving just how effective that these substances are. Because you only have to take them once or a handful of times. Also, they can't be patented because they are natural substances. So there's no money to be made off of doing these treatments. And for that reason, the pharmaceutical industry especially, 
condemns them to no end and paints them as this evil boogeyman that will ruin your life and make you jump out of a 10-story window. Psychedelics instill in people who use them a sort of humility where you recognize how powerful the universe is, but at the same time, it makes your problems feel very small. Kind of like when you're hiking in the mountains. The majestic size of these mountains are so expansive and it makes you feel like everything else outside of this doesn't really matter, but you also sense the power of it and you feel empowered by it. All of this is not to say that psychedelic use does not come without certain risks, because it does. We talked about the importance of set and setting earlier. These substances should never be used in unfamiliar situations with people that you do not know or trust. This can result in a bad trip, a bad experience, and they can be quite terrifying under the wrong circumstances. To be clear, we are not saying that you should only use these substances if you happen to be one of the few lucky people to get into a MAPS trial in a setting with a licensed psychologist and everything like that. However, please be mindful of where you're doing it, who you're doing it with, and what your intention is going in. That will most likely result in a positive experience. Not necessarily guaranteeing one, but most likely will. There are countless anecdotal stories of people who have revelations about their sexuality or what they want in life. And you really want to make sure that you're able to have these revelations under the guidance or care of somebody that you're very comfortable with, in a place that you're very comfortable with. In Western society, we are not really taught to place importance on our consciousness or on substances that help us unlock our consciousness. So more on set and setting. Timothy Leary was a professor at an American university and he coined the term set and setting. And this is very essential whenever you are planning to take a journey with psychedelics. Some ways of preparing for a psychedelic journey and your set and setting would be to only eat small amounts of healthy food or meditating on a specific intention. It's not a bad idea to have what is called a trip sitter, which is a sober person who can take care of you, talk you through an experience, and if things do happen to turn negative or frightening, you'll have someone there to help you. And on that note, I think it's important to talk about scammer shamans, because unfortunately they do exist, and they do try to profit off of people who are trying to come to realizations through psychedelics. I'm starting to feel a little funny here. What are you doing, Indigo? I'm cleansing the air of the evil spirits for you. There's evil spirits in here? The ceiling and the fan are doing really weird things. Like, like what is happening? What, 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 what are you doing to my head? It's called Reiki. I'm channeling your chakras so that way you can break through. Break through, Alvin. You seem very taken with your missionary partner, Levi. I can feel it in your heart chakra. Tell me more about your friend. Oh, Levi, he's the best. Like, he's really helpful and he's really, like, in the spirit. And he's really cute, too. I can feel your heart chakra. It's getting warmer. Ride the snake, Alvin. Yeah. Le Levi's married, but I, 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 I don't know. I've, I, he's really the only person I've ever felt close to, and to be honest, like I really don't like girls much. Oh, that's okay. I don't know if anyone's ever told you that, but that's okay. Like, I've always been too afraid to tell anybody this, but I think that I do want to do missionary work with Levi, just not the way that he thinks. This is amazing. I, I feel okay with admitting things that I, I've always felt too ashamed to talk of. I feel free. Mother Ayahuasca is speaking to you, my child. I feel like I have the power of God within me. You do. You do. That's what I've been trying to tell you, Alvin. You are God. Ah, you're right. I've never felt such freedom. Yes. I've never felt so in touch with my spirituality. Yes! 
I've been waiting my whole life for this. Yes. I don't need any of these chains. I don't need any of these, these, these barriers. You're free. Free. We want to make it a point to say that there are many shamans that travel the country that really do have medical training and their heart is very much in the right place and they really want to help people that have psychological trauma that cannot find it through traditional means. And many shamans are from indigenous tribes that have been practicing these ceremonies for thousands of years. It's a rite of passage in a lot of cultures, many Native American cultures, many South American cultures. There is a long tradition of coming of age ceremonies and many other forms of expanding one's consciousness when the time in their life comes. However, there are people who are doing this just for the money or people who are doing this because they want to be looked at as some kind of a cult leader and they have some very dangerous ideas. And if you are a person that has a lot of trauma and you put yourself in the care of these people that you don't know very well, that, you, that have no qualifications, no training, it could possibly result in a bad experience. They probably charge you obscene amounts of money for the experience too, mm -hmm. which is a key sign of a scammer. Mm -hmm. One substance that is very near and dear to both our hearts is MDMA or ecstasy. It's not technically a psychedelic. Uh, it's referred to as an entheogen. Uh, it helps you to manifest feelings as well. Uh, it promotes the release of serotonin at very high levels in your mind, which really does make you feel amazing. Uh, <laughs> there, there's really no other experience like that in the drug world. And it was being used by psychologists in America legally back in the 70s and 80s, and it was eventually criminalized in the 80s because again, if there's any form of pleasure, that does not profit the right capitalists, it's going to be outlawed. The results of the scientific use of MDMA, especially for couples therapy, were astounding before it was outlawed. And that just goes to show that it's never about whether something works, it's never about whether something is safe, it is always about what is most profitable. That is why everything operates the way that it does under this system. And back to the MAPS studies, Right now, they're using MDMA to help war veterans treat PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. which is huge because a lot of medications that are prescribed by pharmaceuticals actually worsen the effects of PTSD. And MDMA is not something that your body can physically do multiple days in a row. You need up to three months in between sessions. Mm -hmm. So if you can have a profound, moving experience with one therapeutic session of MDMA mm -hmm. to help you like alleviate the trauma due to war, that is huge. And it's also a huge blow to the antidepressant industry. Mm -hmm. And you can only do one session every few months of MDMA because of the extremely high amounts of serotonin that it releases. Your brain needs time to replenish these neurotransmitters. Precisely right. MDMA is not a good drug to take on a regular basis. There have been anecdotal reports of like permanent depression resulting from MDMA abuse because you're messing with your serotonin release system. It is definitely not something to be taken lightly. Out of the rave scene in the 90s, there was beginning to be a coming together of people across races and sexual preferences and life experiences, and it was something that vaguely resembled the time of Woodstock and free love and everyone coming together as it did back then. And I think that this very much terrified the authorities because they saw how that turned out and they really almost lost complete control of society at the time. So in response to the rave scene growing as it did, there were these extremely draconian anti-rave laws passed and really just suppressed that entire scene. What the state fears more than anything is people coming together, caring about each other, not seeing our differences, and not caring. That is why 
MDMA in particular is considered to be extremely dangerous by the ruling class. We wanted to make this video because our video on self-destruction highlighted the negative drug use that we use to cover up trauma and to escape reality. Mm -hmm. So we really wanted to do a video that was a bit more lighthearted and positive that talks about the type of drugs that help you expand your consciousness and help you resolve trauma and create interconnected relationships with yourself and others in the universe. To attain a better understanding of these substances, as always in our videos, Tori and I would like to recommend a reading list. Mm -hmm. uh, a very recent book is Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind. Uh, it's, it's very digestible for ordinary folks because he undergoes several psychedelic experiences throughout it and he was a novice. He is a, a man that's, I believe, in his 60s and had never tried anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so th that's a very uh, easy book for people that have no experience to get into. Also, Smoke Signals by Martin A. Lee is a fantastic book that talks mainly about cannabis. Uh, also, a few other drugs are mentioned that it talks about it in the context of American history. It goes from Prohibition through the Civil Rights era, the anti-war movement, and how all of that relates to cannabis culture. Also, Acid Test by Tom Schroeder. That is a book that details the life of Rick Doblin, who is the founder of MAPS, and it talks about the science behind the MDMA studies. It also examines other psychedelics, such as LSD, and what their experimental history is and their practical application today. This is all very important knowledge to have, so we encourage you to read these books. You can do it on Audible, listen to audiobooks if you want to, but definitely educate yourself, especially if you're considering doing these for yourself. So we hope you enjoyed this video, everybody. Please do not forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And we'd also like to ask you to hit the notification bell so you don't miss our videos. And YouTube has added another step to that. So if you hit the notification bell, don't forget to hit all notifications. Otherwise, you may not see our video. And if you are capable, please consider supporting our work on Patreon. We really appreciate all the members of the tribe that help us continue doing this work. We have also set up a PayPal for one-time donations if you are more comfortable with that. We appreciate everyone that has helped us out recently. Your donations really do mean the world to us. We love doing this work. We love building this community, and we really want to be able to do it full time. So if you are able to support this channel, please help us out in any way that you can. We would very much appreciate it, Tribe. Thank you so much for being here, and we will see you in the next video or podcast. We hope that you will check out our podcast if you haven't already. Thank you so much, Tribe. We love you guys and solidarity. Solidarity.